Again, welcome to Fundamentals in Computer and IT. In this lecture, we're going to cover the system units, that is the processing and memory. This is unit 2-2 lectures. So our main objective is to explain the functions of the hardware components commonly found inside the system units, such as CPU, GPU, memory, buses, and expansion cards. Also, we're going to describe how peripheral devices or other hardware can be added to a computer, either through expansion cards and ports. Also, we're going to understand how a computer CPU and memory component process program instructions and data. So first we start with inside the system unit. The system unit is the main case of a computer. So a computer system is the whole box on the case of a computer. And normally it houses the processing hardware for a computer. Also, it contains the storage device, the power supply and the cooling fans. Also, it houses the processor, which is the central processing unit, the memory interfaces to connect to peripheral devices, such as printers, uh, monitors, etc. Now, with a desktop computer, it usually looks like a rectangular box. And this is an example of it. So this is, again, our system unit. Now, inside the system, we can see we have the power supply with a fan to cool out the system. We also have the motherboard. And we have the memory slots to, again, set our memories. Then we have the memory modules. As we said, we have the motherboard is the main board lying down with all the components connected to it. Actually, that's why it's called the motherboard. It consists of all the components and also some of the boards. Also, we have expansion slots, expansion card, the CPU, which is the main brain of the computer. So here we say the CPU performs the calculations and does the comparisons that is needed for processing, as well as controls the other parts of a computer system. So we always say the central processing unit is the main brain of the computer. This is where computations takes place. Also, we have the power supply that will convert the standard electrical power into a form the computer can use. Example, a computer normally uses a DC current or direct current, not alternative current AC. So the electrical power may be converted by, again, the power supply system. Also, we have a fan that cools the CPU. Now we have the hard drive, that's where we normally store our data, programs, et cetera. And then there's a drive bay. The drive base normally hold the storage devices, such as again, the DVD, et cetera. So we start with the motherboard. And here we say motherboard is a computer chip. And a computer chip is a very small pieces of silicon or other semiconducting material onto which integrated circuits are embedded. Now, a circuit board is a thin board containing computer chips and other electronic components. Also, we have a system board, which is the main circuit board inside the system unit to which all devices must connect. And that's the motherboard. We also have external devices such as uh, monitors, keyboard, mouse, and also printers. Normally, external devices are called the peripheral devices. We also have a wireless devices such as the Bluetooth. We also have the power supply. And the power supply, normally, as we said earlier, connects to the motherboard. And the goal is to deliver electricity to the system, to the personal computer. And also you have to be a portable computer to use rechargeable battery pack. Now with a desktop computer, we connect direct to the AC. Example would be a portable computer would be the laptop or notebook. In this case, it's connected to a rechargeable battery pack. 
And most of these batteries are non-removable and non-removable batteries more difficult and expensive to replace. Also, we have the drive base. The drive base is a rectangular metal racks that is inside the system unit. And it normally house the storage devices, such as again, the hard drive or the DVD drive, etc. So example is a hard drive, the CD, DVD drive, flash memory card reader. Also it's connected to the motherboard with a cable. Actually, every components in a computer system are connected to the motherboard or the element, including the CPU, the memory, etc. Also, we have the processor, and we said the processor is the main brain or the brain of the computer, also called the central processing unit. And it's a secretary and also component package together and connected directly to the motherboard also. Now, the central processing unit have different components or elements. And for example, we have the logic control unit, the arithmetic logic unit does the arithmetic operations. And also we have the control unit, which again coordinates the flow of data programs from the CPU to the main memory or main memory, main, main memory to the CPU. So we say the process again does vast majority of processing for a computer. Also called a processor, also it's called a microprocessor when talking about the personal computers. Now we will go through what is a processing speed. And for example, a CPU clock speed is measure, a one measurement of processing speed. And it's measured in mega S. A mega S means million S or giga S, which is billion S. A unit of X S is one cycle per second. So we say the higher CPU clock speed, the more instruction process per second. So has stands for one cycle again per second. Also, the alternate measure of processing speed is the number of instructions a CPU can process per second. Again, the alternate measure of this processing speed, it depends on the number of instructions that it can perform per second or process per second. So for example, we have a mega flops, which is in millions, gigaflops in billions or tera teraflops in trillions. Now the benchmark test can be used again to elevate or evaluate, sorry, a benchmark test can be used to evaluate overall processing speed. Uh, but one thing we should know is that the processing speed of a CPU is one cycle per second. So if we say mega S, it means million cycles per second. And S is a cycle per second. So how many instructions we can do per second is the number of uh, the S. And also here we talk about the word size. And that's the amount of data that a CPU can manipulate at one time. Uh, normally it's 32 or 64 bits. For example, we have an operating system having 64 bits, which means again, the word size will be 64 bits. If an operating system is 32 bits, means the word size is 32 bits. Also, we have what we call the cache memory. This is a special memory that is between the CPU and the main memory. And normally data is stored there that are ready to be processed by the CPU, but not yet. Now we also have a registered memory. A registered memory is inside the CPU. So normally it holds the data or program that is being processed by the CPU. A cache memory normally will hold the data that is ready or is getting ready to be processed by the CPU. So here we say a cache memory is a special group of a very fast memory chips located on or close to the CPU. We have a level, so level one is the fastest, then level two, then level three. 
Now, the more cache memory typically means faster processing because when you have a larger cache memory, that means the data will be very close or it can hold a lot of data that can be processed by the CPU. And since the cache is very close to the CPU, it means CPU can fast, it fastly assess the data. And here we say usually internal cache also is built into the CPU. So if the internal cache is very large, it means it can hold a lot of data, which is being processed by the CPU. We also have what we call the bus. A bus normally is the conductor, or we we'll say the connection between all the components. So we may have a bus that connects the CPU to the memory. Now, if the bus is wider, it means it can transfer more data and need to be more faster, completed and work. So we talk about the bus width, the bus speed, and also the bandwidth. So first, a bus, as, as we said, is an electronic path over which data can travel. So it's more or less a connection between the elements, let's say between CPU and the memory. Also, it's found inside the CPU because that's the main connection to all the components and on also on the motherboard. And bus width is the number of wires in the bus over which a data can travel. So the more the number of wires you have, the more we can move data very fast or larger data at a time. So a wider bus allow more data to be transferred at one time. And that's advantage. So we can see example of a diagram. We have the eight bit bots. We have the system bit bots. So we can see that the system bit can transfer more data at one time than the eight bit bots. So we say the bot width and speed determine the throughput or bandwidth of the bus. Also, the amount of data that can be transferred by the bus in a given time period would depend on the bus width. That's the size. Next is a memory. So memory also refers to chip-based storage that is located inside a system unit. So a storage refers to the amount of long-term storage available to the computer. We have random access memory, which is volatile. Volatile means when the power is off in our computer, the information or data on the random access memory will be lost. So data store in the RAM is supported by electricity when the computer is on. And normally when we are doing any work in our computer, we access our program or data from the RAM. A very simple example, when we boot up or we start our computer, the operating system must be loaded to the RAM because that's where a work will start from. So if I open any program or a data, a file, it must be loaded to the RAM, the random access memory. So if a, a CPU wants to process some data, the data will come from the RAM. So a CPU doesn't have access to our hard drive, which we will call the secondary storage device. So normally CPU can access data from the memory. So we call the random access memory RAM as the computer's main memory. And it consists of chips arranged on a circuit board called a memory module, which are also plugged into the motherboard. So stores essential parts of operating system, programs, and data that the computer is currently using. So most of the time when we are working with our computer, we work from the RAM. Our data will be loaded to the RAM and we do our work from there. So RAM is volatile. Volatile, as we said earlier, means when there's no power, the data in the RAM is lost. So you will say the RAM content loss when the computer is shut off. Also the ROM, ROM stands for read only memory. And this is a very special memory that holds some program or some data that cannot be changed. So it performs on specific tasks. 
we also have a fresh memory. Fresh memories also are not volatile or it's non-volatile, which means if the power is off or on, we still have our data. So wrong read only memory is non-volatile. When the power is off, the data is still there. Now, in memory, we say everything is measured in bytes. The bytes is a unit for a data in computer system. So normally in our earlier lectures, we say eight bits stand for one byte. And that's how computer system recognize data. For example, a single character, let's say A, may have eight bits of different combination of zero and ones. I need to represent a byte. So for example, if we want to know the size of a memory, we will say the size of a memory is uh, one gigabyte, which means one billion bytes. It can hold up to billion characters, symbols, etc. So here we say the amount stored depends on the CPU and also depends on the operating system being used. So most, again, personal computers use the SD RAM. And we also have the MRAM and PRAM, which is non-volatile RAM under development and runs on the research process. So a typical memory may have a unique address. So let's assume this is our computer system. Again, we know computer technology is nano technology. So here we may have a memory. We can see that each memory has a unique address, same as like our street address or our home address. Each address is unique. So here we say each location memory has an address and each location typically holds one byte. Also computer systems set up and maintains directory tables to fast, facilitate retrieval of the data. We discussed about registers, it's also a special memory. And here we use the term high-speed memory. Why? Because it's inside a CPU. So the data is that is being processed at a particular time. It's normally stored in the registers. So registers are special memory that are stored inside CPU, that are inside CPU. Some cache memory will be inside CPU or outside the CPU. So this is used to store data and also intermediately result during the processing time of the CPU. And it's the fastest type of memory because again, CPU can access it faster than any memory. Now we'll say the main memory is the slowest. Cache is faster than main memory because main memory is closer to the CPU. Register is the most fastest because register is inside the CPU. And we also have the read-only memory, as we said, this is non-volatile chips that is located on the motherboard into which data or programs have been permanently, permanently stored. This can be retrieved by the computer when needed and also normally consists of a special program that is being executed and being replaced with fresh, mem fresh memory. A fresh memory also is a non-volatile memory chip that can be used for storage, almost same as read-only memory. Have begun to replace the read-only memory for storage system information. Also now stores the firmware for personal computers and other devices. Also built into many types of devices, such as the media tablet, mobile phones, digital cameras, has a fresh memory. Normally, a typical smartphone uses a fresh memory as a storage device. Also, we have the fans in our computer system. We say the fan normally cool down the CPU. CPU is always processing data. So the goal of a fan is to cool down the CPU and other system units, such as the power supply also transformer need to be cooled down. So fans used on most personal computers to help cool the CPU and also the system unit. Heat is an ongoing problem for CPU and also computer manufacturers. Uh, as we all know, normally a large computer such as supercomputer 
or mainframe computer will be stored in a very cool environment. The goal is that they have more CPU, more processors, and they are processing a lot of amount of data. So it will generate a lot of heat. So it needs to be cooled down. Now, if it's very hot, especially CPU or any of the elements are very hot, it can damage the components overheat. So cooler chips run faster. And also we have what we call the heat sinks. It's a small component typically made out of aluminum with fins that help to dissipate the heat. Next, we talk about buses. A bus is again, a special connections, or I'll use the term a conductor that uh, allow data to flow from one position to another or from one element to another. For example, between memory and CPU, there must be a, a bus connected. So the main definition is it's an electronic path within a computer over which data travels, located within the CPU and again, etched onto the motherboard. We also have the expansion bus that connects the CPU to periphery or typically input and output devices. So expansion slots allow us to connect any periphery devices to a computer. For example, will be a printer also. We also have the memory bus which connect the CPU directly to RAM. And then we have a front side bus which connect the CPU to the chipset that connect the CPU to the rest of the bus architecture. So in general, a bus would be a connector or it's a conductor material that allow data to flow from one element to another. Next, we talk about ports and connectors. So a port is a connector on the exterior of a computer system unit to which a device may be attached. So example would be a monitor. A monitor has a special port that we have to connect to a computer or a printer port also. So a typical desktop computer port including power connector, firmware, VGA monitor, network, USB, audio, and HDMI. These are all ports. Others include IRDA or Bluetooth ports, SATA ports or Thunderbolt ports, which is Apple devices. Now, most computers support the plug and play standard. So portable computers have ports similar to desktop computers, but often not as many. Also smartphones and mobile devices have more limited expansion capabilities usually have a USB port, HDMI port, and all flash memory card slots. So flash memory cards often use the secure digital format, SD. And also we have a mini SD and micro SD cards are similar than regular SD cards. So this example of some port, the, yeah, we have a, a laptop or a notebook, we have a USB port, a network port to connect to a network system, VGA port, <coughs> excuse me, HDMI port, headphone jack, and et cetera. <coughs> so yeah, we have a quick quiz here. First is which type of memory is erased when the power goes out? And we said uh, ROM or RAM or flash memory. <coughs> and our solution will be RAM. Now, true or false CPU can also be called a motherboard, and that's false. An electronic path within a computer over which data travels is called, again, a bus. So our first answer, first question answer will be RAM, because which type of memory is erased when the power goes off? We say RAM. RAM is volatile. 
a CPU is the processor, and we also have a motherboard. Motherboard is the main board that all the elements or components of the computer are connected to. So the answer here will be false. <coughs> the CPU is not called a motherboard. An electronic path, again, is the boss. So again, our first answer is B, RAM, two, false, and three, the boss. Now, how the CPU works? Uh, normal, as we say, CPU consists of different types of uh, elements or components that works together. And we have what we call the transistors, which are the key element of a microprocessor, the size. And these transistors are made of semiconductor materials that can act like a switch controlling the flow of electrons inside the chip. Now, today's CPU contain hundreds of millions of transistors. And the number of doubles about every 18 months. This is more slow prediction that every around 18 months, 18 months again, the speed of a CPU may double. So a typical CPU component is arithmetic logic unit. This is very important unit because this is the element or the component that perform all the arithmetic operations and also the logical decisions. Computer system normally follows the logical decisions, which is a condition will be true or false. If X greater than Y, if it's true, do something. If it's false, don't do it. So most computer operations based on logical decisions. So this will perform the arithmetic involving integers and logical operations. We also have the floating point unit that perform the decimal arithmetic. Then we have the control unit which coordinates and controls the activities within the CPU core. Example will be data flowing from the memory to the CPU or cache to CPU, etc. Then make sure that again, the data in the register should not be overflow. Overflow means we have so much data that the register cannot uh, store all of them. Uh, control unit to make sure that there's always enough for the register not to be overflow. And also not underflow. Underflow means there's space in the register, but there's no data. But the CPU need the data to process. The data is somewhere else. It's not in the register. So control unit again, make sure, coordinate, and also control the activities. Then we also have the prefetch unit. This attempt to retrieve data and instructions before they are needed for processing in order to avoid delays. We also have the decode unit. The decode unit, unit normally translates instruction from the prefetch un unit, so they are understood by the control unit, arithmetic logic unit, and also the floating point unit. And we have registers and internal cache memory. This is a special story device that store data instructions that is needed by the CPU. Then we have the bus interface unit, allows the core to communicate with other CPU components. Sometimes we may have a CPU with more than one processor. So if we have four processors, which is called a quad core, there will be a, a bus interface unit that will make sure these four processors can communicate with each other. So this is how a CPU works. Example here, this is how the element. We have the control unit. Control unit is in charge of the entire process, making sure everything happens at the right time. It instructs the ALU, the FPU, which is the floating point unit, and also the registers to what to do based on instruction from the decode unit. Now with the arithmetic logic unit and floating point unit, this is the main element that perform the arithmetic operations and also the logical operations. A typical CV, CPU may have registers, and this is the device or that would say the memory that holds the results or the data that being processed. Then we have the bus interface unit. 
And this is a place where the data and instructions enter or leave the call. So this is a system clock and machine cycle. And a typical CPU, what it does first, we are going to fetch a data. So step one, the next instruction is fetched from cache or RAM. Then the instructions are decoded so that the CPU may understand. And then we execute this step three. The instructions are carried out to execute. And after we get the result, we store it. So the data or result are stored in the register of the RAM. So normally we call this the machine cycle process, the system clock and the machine cycle. Fetch, we get data, decode so that the CPU understand, then we execute. After we get the result, we store it back to the RAM. So that's machine cycle again, a series of operation involved in the execution of a single machine level. The instructions, improve the performance of your system today. We had more memory and perform system maintenance. And we always said in order to improve our performance of our computer, especially the speed, is to again, upgrade the memory, increase the memory size. We normally don't change the CPU because CPU is one of the expensive component in the computer system. So if memory doesn't improve the performance that's increasing the memory doesn't improve the comp performance, then it's time to again, change the computer. Or another options, if you have any program that you don't need, you can unstore it. If you have any data that you don't need, you can delete them. Also this may free more space and maybe improve the performance of the computer. So we can delete the temporary files and also error checking and defragmentation. And normally every pretty system come with a defragment. De so we can defragment our hard drive. The goal here is to improve the performance. Data are scattered everywhere. We want to put all the data together in one area. Also good idea to scan for viruses and spyware continually especially if our computer is connected to a network system or the internet, there's a chance that we may a virus or something. New. Okay. Now, if I'm using a computer as a standard low computer, then I don't care about virus because my computer is not connected to any computer or the internet. So it's safe. Also, we should clean out the dust at least once or twice a year. The goal here again is improving our com making computer fast and better. Buy a larger or second hard drive, basically to store your data that you don't need. And also upgrade your internet connection if it's very slow, upgrade your video graphics card, etc. So we are going to end the lectures here again. Our main goal of these lectures is to understand the concept of computer systems, especially the system units what elements they are and their functions and how they work also. Again, if you have any question during class, you can ask a question or you can send me email. Thank you.